Your Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the FMB Networking Hub by CL Middle East eSummit and Meetings. Today, we gather to discuss the present and the future of what is a vital industry, the food, beverage and hospitality sectors. This year has underlined the continued significance of the sector for the world. Each of us works in a sector that underpins the daily lives of all and which fuels the global economy. By coming together today, we forge new relationships with one another, we build fresh opportunities for our whole sector, and we discover novel innovations that can propel our industry forward. That is why, on behalf of Abu Dhabi National Exhibitions Company and Comexposium organizers of CL Middle East, it is my pleasure to welcome each of you to this virtual event. Today, we are going to hear from industry leaders from across the region and the agri-food world, who will discuss how they are helping enable the future of the food, beverage, and hospitality sectors. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Please join me in welcoming Her Excellency Maryam bint Mohammed Saeed Harib Limheri, Minister of State for Food and Water Security, to deliver the welcome speech for this event. Good afternoon, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you're all well and safe. It isn't the same not being able to see you all in person, but we are all thankful that through these digital platforms, we have an effective means to communicate and support each other through these unprecedented times. And so it is a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak to you today and to open the CL eSummit program, perhaps the most important edition held in view of the ongoing coronavirus outbreak that has had such important implications for the agriculture, food and beverage industry. There is no doubt that this pandemic has had a profound impact on the global food supply and distribution landscape with the necessary lockdown measures affecting the just-in-time supply chains that we have come to take for granted over the years. This is something the UAE has felt keenly, importing as it does over 90% of its food. Fortunately, as a country, we have been able to weather the worst of the pandemic and ensure our shelves have remained stocked during this critical time. We have kept our heads above water thanks to the resilience that we have built into the UAE's food security system and the launch of the UAE's national food security strategy. The strategy has set a strong foundation to enable us to deal with food crises and emergencies just like the one we are currently experiencing. It does this by establishing specific targets for food safety drills and the reserve supply of staple food commodities as well as for widening our international sources of food. This latter aspect, helped by the UAE government's policy of forging firm and friendly relations with other countries around the world, has been key for overcoming the obstacles that we came across over the last few months. But, despite ensuring continued supplies, the food and beverage companies are nevertheless facing significant reduced consumptions. At-home eating has increased, but out-of-home consumption which historically generated the highest margins, has experienced a huge downturn. It is possible that this might be a long-term trend in customer behavior. This is especially significant for the UAE, with the FNB industry a vital driver of the country's economy. The sector's incredible rate of expansion in recent years is proof of this. FNB's direct contribution to the UAE's GDP increased by 138% in the 10 years to 2017, with employment in the sector growing by 119% over the same period. Unsurprisingly, COVID-19 has had a massive impact on this sector this year. The necessary lockdown measures to contain the spread of the virus meant that restaurants were required to temporarily shut their doors to customers, and then once allowed to reopen again, they were faced with strict restrictions imposed on the numbers of customers they were allowed to admit, something that has clearly affected demand. However, the pandemic has also created a number of opportunities for those operating in the FMB space. Online retailers and e-commerce platforms are enjoying increasing growth, 
with one leading hypermarket chain in the UAE seeing a 300% increase in online orders and a 59% increase in new customers on its e-commerce site just between the months of February and April of this year. General e-commerce platforms have also now ventured into grocery supply along with their traditional retail trading. Healthy food options are also becoming increasingly important to customers at this time, perhaps unsurprisingly in view of heightened awareness about well-being in the age of the coronavirus. Sales of clean, natural and organic foods are increasing too, with supermarkets launching their own bio ranges that are proving very popular. Sustainability is also factoring more prominently, with consumers increasingly educated about the importance of eating food from more sustainable sources. With that comes a new trendsetter, and that is sourcing foods locally. This represents a chance for the FMB stakeholders to earn revenue by catering to a better informed public that is demanding food that is not produced in ways that harm the environment and that reflects transparency when it comes to nutritional information and sourcing of food. Ladies and gentlemen, it is clear that we are undergoing changes that are having a far-reaching impact on the food and beverage sector changes that may ultimately be permanent as opposed to transient. This compels us to take stock of not only how we produce and distribute our food, but our fundamental relationship with it. We should take note of the shift in demand trends and adapt to it. These shifts are all towards more sustainable food systems. I'm sure today we'll generate some very interesting conversations about a new paradigm shift towards more sustainable food systems, and I look forward to the discussions ahead. Thank you for your participation, and I look forward to seeing you all in the near future. Until then, please stay safe and keep well. Thank you, Your Excellency, for your inspiring and insightful speech. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we shall now have our opening panel focused on the food and agriculture sector in the Middle East. I would like to welcome His Excellency Saeed Al-Bahri Salim Al-Amri, Director General of Abu Dhabi Agriculture and Food Safety Authority, who will be discussing food control and ADAFSA's strategy. Your Highnesses, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the 11th edition of CL Middle East. I am pleased to see a great level of participation from different countries around the world attending this exceptional edition of CL Summit. This year's edition takes place under the extraordinary circumstances of a global pandemic. The drastic impact of COVID-19 on all aspects of life, including food supplies, has made us rethink our priorities and has reshaped global operations in the agriculture and food sector. This highlights the importance of advancing the food, beverage and hospitality sector at the global and regional levels and the need to design more resilient food systems that can bridge the gap between global food supply and demand. I take this opportunity to emphasize the importance of joining our efforts and learning from the recent experience with the pandemic. I would also like to highlight the great support provided by our wise leadership to this vital sector and the great ability to turn challenges into opportunities. The wise decisions and flexible measures taken by the government contributed to reducing the pandemic's economic and social impacts on the food sector and maintaining our food supplies. This ensured community well-being by providing safe food to the public despite all the challenges imposed by supply disruption around the world. As the local entity responsible for agriculture and food security, we achieved several milestones that made Abu Dhabi exemplary in its efforts to advance the food sector. We achieved a score of 99% in food safety ranking according to the FAO Food Safety Index. And we are proud to have an effective and advanced legislative and regulatory framework along the entire food chain. 
We are focusing on health risk assessment to ensure food safety, maintain animal and plant health, and monitor supply chain from farm to fork. In this regard, I would like to mention that Abu Dhabi hosted two meetings for the International Food Safety Authorities Network, InfoSan. The last one was in 2019, with the aim of sharing experiences on food safety challenges. We are also keen on adopting a flexible strategy and agile systems to address food emergencies, benefiting from the efficient management of COVID-19 crisis. We are working on facilitating food shipment release systems and implementing smart, proactive, and risk-based inspection systems. Abu Dhabi have always focused on creating an environment that is attractive to investments and supportive of businesses. Therefore, this e-summit is an opportunity for all leading global companies in food and hospitality industry to build promising partnerships with national companies and local investors and open broader horizons for their businesses to utilize the significant potential of the market. Distinguished guests, these unprecedented circumstances have taught us the importance of working together towards finding innovative solutions to improve global food supply chains and to develop a more flexible and adaptive system in the food and hospitality industry. This is what we look forward to by having you today in this important summit. During this pandemic, Abu Dhabi managed to take a great leap in the agriculture sector, increase quality and competitiveness of local products to enhance the UAE's food security system and create new opportunities in local food industries. This leading experience strengthens our belief that we can overcome these circumstances and attain more achievements and progress for our countries and communities. I would like to conclude by welcoming you again and emphasizing your great role in fostering business relationships in food and beverage sector. And I wish you a continued success and prosperity. Thank you and stay safe. مثل أي غرسة تبدأ صغيرة بعدها تغد هذه الغرسة شجرة طيبة نحن كيان واحد مسؤول عن زراعتنا ثروتنا الحيوانية سلامة غذائنا وأمننا الغذائي والحيوي معا نحن أقوى معا سنكمل المسيرة ونحقق حلم زايد هيئة أبو ظبي للزراعة والسلامة الغذائية أمن غذائي وقطاع زراعي مستدام Thank you your excellency I would now like to welcome his excellency Mohammed bin Abed al Mazrui, President and Chairman of the Board of Directors for the Arab Authority on Agriculture Investment and Development, AAAID, to offer us more insights into agri food investment in the Arab world. The Arab Authority for Agriculture Investment and Development, AAAID, is pleased to be participating for the fourth consecutive year in one of the leading food and beverage events, the prestigious Seattle Middle East exhibition organized by ADNIC. Please accept my sincere gratitude for having AAAID as part of this innovative and vital event. I would like also to thank the organizer for their professionalism and support towards AAAID over the past few years. I take this opportunity to welcome and thank all participants and attendees joining us from all over the world. Esteemed speakers and valued guests, 2020 has been a year marked with challenges. These challenges have motivated scientists, technologists and agriculturalists to create mechanisms and innovative technologies in different sectors and fields. The unprecedented spread of the COVID-19 virus stimulated several innovative and creative efforts 
to overcome the financial, social, economic, and environmental challenges that affected individuals, businesses, and governments. The level of the challenge is evident in the World Bank report on the agricultural sector GDP of the UAE, which has fallen by minus 5% in 2020. IIIED's efforts and activity in the field of agricultural investment and development is represented by 53 affiliate companies. Projects and companies are actively monitored and continuously enhanced to align their strategies with current global standards. We at IIID have adapted a new and enhanced strategic plan for agricultural investment, where the criteria for all investment opportunities and the new projects are set based on benchmarking with best global practices. The flexibility of the new strategic plan enables IIID to respond to unforeseen changes in a timely and appropriate manner. IIID has also launched an initiative for fulfilling the urgent demand of Arab countries for basic foods, commodities, through its affiliate companies and their inter-Arab partners, resulting in increased agricultural trade. The initiative was a consequence of COVID-19 and the breakdown of international trade and food supply due to limited mobility. The goal is to secure the nutrition needs of the Arab nations and rid them of the fear of food shortages. IIID and its affiliate companies create and implement numerous sustainable models that assist in increasing agricultural production and productivity, promote socio-economic development, protect the environment, and build a skilled workforce through training and capacity building programs. IIID currently has invested in six companies in the UAE, three of which are currently operational, while the rest are in various stages of establishment. The total value of IIID's investment in the UAE reaches about 343 million dirham in corporate assets. Emirates Rawabi Company, one of the IIID's affiliate company, is a pioneer integrated dairy and poultry products company, offering customers high-quality healthy food products. Established in 2000 by the merger of Rawabi Dairy and Emirates Modern Poultry, the company holds a leading market position in a dairy and poultry products. The total area of the Emirates Rawabi company reaches about 1,218 hectares. The company's success is reflected through being listed as a top Arab company in Forbes magazine. Recently, IIID and Rajhi International for Investment partnered to create Transagri Holding Limited, a model agriculture investment entity with the objective to be a pioneer in augmenting the performance of existing agricultural companies and integrating related operations to enhance food security in the Arab region. The company also aims to contribute to sustainable agricultural development through the integration of agricultural projects, the transfer of modern agricultural technologies, implementing a smart farming system, and supporting the development of rural societies. Ladies and gentlemen, IIID would like to take this opportunity to invite businesses, financial institutions, agricultural organizations, and governments to join IIID in combining know-how and expertise to improve existing practices, focus on in creating innovative and sustainable methods 
that support the advancement of the agricultural sector and thus promote global food security. Ladies and gentlemen, AAAID would like to take this opportunity to invite businesses, financial institutions, agricultural organizations, and governments to join AAAID in combining know-how and expertise to improve existing practices focus in creating innovative and sustainable methods that support the advancement of the agricultural sector and thus promote global food security. Thank you, Your Excellency. Please welcome His Excellency Rashid Abdel Karim Al Blushi, Under Secretary of the Abu Dhabi Department Economic Development, to speak about the role of Abu Dhabi Department of Economic Development in supporting the agriculture and food international investors. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Abu Dhabi Department of Economic Development through its Industrial Development Bureau, IDB, takes a great interest to participate in this global virtual platform and network with leading international companies specialized in the food and beverage sectors. This events fall in the line with the department's role in supporting the UAE national agenda on food and security and help achieve the objective of the National Food Security Strategy 2051. We look to enhance the business relationship in the FMB sector as we anticipate the participation of the global industrial leaders and share their insight on their challenges with the sector. ADDED spares no effort to enhance the investments environment and attract more industrial investments within the FMB sector. We in Abu Dhabi recently launched the Foreign Direct Investments License that offers 100% ownership to the foreign investors. The FDI license comprises 122 diversified economic activities across several sectors, including the agriculture, industrial, and services. The FDI license target capital investments ranging from the minimum of 2 million dirhams to 100 million dirhams and over. ADDED currently implements the basic industrial project, which seeks to define a vital industrial investments areas in Abu Dhabi, while limiting the covered sectors to four, including food industrial. The project aims at making Abu Dhabi self-sufficient in the local production of basic and consumer commodities. Eight investments areas for food industrial were also identified in addition to existing investments. We are keen to continue our efforts and strengthen coordination between IDB and Abu Dhabi Investment Office, ADIO, to study the various potential investments, field and development existing basic industrial, including food, 
we aim to achieve self-sufficiency in identified basic industrial, particularly food, and analyze the gaps between local products, basic products, and those who, which are imported. It also seeks to identify investments field, encouraging local producing to other basic products. The latest figure have shown that in 2019, the value of imported animals products amounted to 2.7 billion dirhams. The important plant products were valued at 2.6 billion dirhams. Abu Dhabi food exports value amounted to more than 6 billion in the same year. Re-export of the food products through the port of Abu Dhabi amounted to be 3.2 billion. The production license within the Emirates of Abu Dhabi reached 69 within the average investments value of 5.4 billion dirhams. The under construction license within the Emirates of Abu Dhabi reached 24 with an average investment value of 1.1 billion dirhams. The industrial pioneer license within the Emirates of Abu Dhabi reached 43 with an average investment value of 985 million dirhams. The food industrial establishment in Abu Dhabi city reached 38 with an average investment value of 3.1 billion dirhams. The food industrial establishment in Al Ain city reached 25 establishments with an average investment value of 2 billion dirhams. The food industrial establishment within Zafra region reached six establishments with an average of 221 million dirhams. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency. We will now begin with our first session titled Agri-Food Growth and Entrepreneurship in the UAE, delivered by His Excellency Salmin Al-Amri, CEO of Al-Dahra Agriculture Company, and Mr. Mansour al marar Acting Director Commercial Zone Development of Khalifa Industrial Zone, Abu Dhabi, Kezar. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. In a fast-moving modern world where skyscrapers, commercial and industrial developments have taken over a large proportion of land, we remain rooted in nature and focused on farming crops for human and animal consumption. We are Aldara Agriculture, a leader in the agribusiness industry. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. As a Dahra, we are growers and producers with the missions of making food safe. That's the main things. Available and secure in the communities that we work in. With the recent pandemic, our partnership with the UAE government has been important to ensure the resources are available at all times and that our nations become self-sufficient as fast as possible. The key commodities we have worked in in these years, besides the animal feed where we grow it globally in many countries around the world, rice, flowers, grains, fresh produce, both fruits and vegetables, which now allow us to serve a large customer base nationally and internationally. In UAE, we have a different facilities. Uh, we have silos where we can store up to 300,000 tons of grains. And we are using latest technology uh, in greenhouse. And we are talking about 100,000 square meters where we grow vegetables 365 days. And we operate state-of-the-art rice mill, which is the first one in the region. Over time, we have developed a vast product portfolio. And there was one mis missing piece to our supply chain, which was to reach to the end customers directly. We had always de dealt with the big retailers, chains, but we decided this year to launch our own B2C platform to ensure, to enable us to close the cycle. We are now doing a home delivery in UAE through our new platform, Food Crowd. Food Crowd has been created with the aim of connecting uh, with the local community through a uh, food. 
which is very important to us, giving uh, people the direct access to fresh quality products growing by us locally, internationally, and through a trusted partners with the best agriculture and food safety practices. We aim to build a strong community and through our e-grocery platform, which showing a strong commitment towards innovations and sustainabilities, because food and community are our passions. And we are passionate about delivering the highest quality, fresh and tasty food to our customers. Thank you. Your Excellencies, distinguished viewers. It gives me great pleasure to be with you here today, virtually, and talk to you about what Kizad and Abu Dhabi Ports Industrial Zone Cluster is all about. My name is Mansour Al-Marar, and I'm the Acting Director of Commercial Zone Development in Kizad. Khalifa Industrial Zone Abu Dhabi, branded as Kizad, offers unique value proposition for companies looking to cater for the rapidly growing food market in the region and beyond. The food market in the Middle East is estimated to see a combined annual growth of around 7.9% over the next five years. This is more than double the pace of the industry global growth. The UAE has the necessary infrastructure needed to support the food industry growth and is proactively developing its policies and strategies to enable this growth. The UAE and Abu Dhabi specifically has developed key enablers for food-related industries to expand and flourish as part of a broader national food security strategy. For food investors specifically, the Emirate offers the ability to plug into a progressive, well-planned and low-cost industrial ecosystem that offers up to 100% foreign ownership together with substantial tax and duty benefits. The industrial cities and free zone clusters at Abu Dhabi ports covers a combined land area of around 5.8 billion square feet and currently host more than 1,400 global, regional and local companies in Abu Dhabi. It includes two major hubs, Khalifa Industrial Zone Abu Dhabi, the integrated trade logistics and industrial hub in the region, and Zone Score, the largest operator of purpose-built economic zone and workers' residential cities in the UAE. Kizad also provides products and solutions for different segments, ranging from SMEs all the way up to large companies. Pre-built facilities with multi-purpose usage are available for companies that want to quickly establish storage or processing facilities. Also, service plots are available for entities that are interested in longer-term customized solutions to complement their current and future business requirements. All these options are available in both mainland and free zone jurisdictions, allowing for optimum flexibility to meet the specific business needs. Kizad's strategic location in proximity to major markets within the UAE, such as Dubai and Abu Dhabi, offers outstanding access opportunities to target largest number of consumers. Kizad is located within 90 minute drive to 70% of UAE population. In Kizad, seamless integration with Abu Dhabi ultra modern deep water Khalifa port provides high quality, optimized and low cost experience for investors to easily import and export cargoes with fully integrated world-class supply chain and logistics support. Customers in Kizad also enjoy swift entry to target markets with the added benefits of low setup and operation cost, efficient supply of utilities, a world-class infrastructure, multimodal connectivity and proximity to raw materials. Because of this, the award-winning industrial zone can offer endless opportunities to engage with a community of suppliers and service providers. Thanks to our cluster-based approach, Kizad has managed to create an integrated ecosystem for food industries. 
Among the main clusters at Kizad is the food cluster, which is home to over 30 companies serving major local, regional, and global markets in the food processing, storage, distribution, packaging, and also ag tech industries. This prime sector is strongly supported by specialized logistic service providers across Kizad that offers optimized cargo movement services and an array of warehousing solutions, including both cold and chilled storage. And in a further boost to food sector investor, the zone hosts a growing number of advanced laboratories that offer testing and certification services that enables in industries to come and establish and get their good, goods cleared and certified as efficient as possible. Kizad is committed to enabling manufacturing and trade within the UAE and across the region and is increasingly recognized as the premier industrial and economic zone provider for companies that wants to wish to set up a base of operation in Abu Dhabi and expand to the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency and Mr. Mansour for your insights. We will now begin our second session titled Technology Enabled Food Supply and Production delivered by His Excellency Engineer Jamal Salim al dahiri CEO of Silal Food and Technology and Mr. Mohammed Joan al dahiri Chairman of Friends Maker Capital Investment LLC. Please join me in welcoming them. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is a great pleasure to be part in Sial 2020 e-Summit. At the beginning, I would like to introduce Silal. Silal was recently established by ADQ, one of the region's largest holding companies with a broad portfolio of major enterprises. To diversify food sources and support the Abu Dhabi government effort to source food supply chains, as well as increase the production, sustainable sourcing and distribution of essential food for the benefit of the local community. After the recently COVID-19 pandemic sweeping across the world and disrupting supply chain, there has been a renewed interest in exploring opportunities to increase self-sufficiency. Therefore, taking this objective into consideration, along with other strategic objectives, we have identified our mission at Silal to increase volumes and variety of locally grown food, secure food supply chain, ensure that the UAE population has access to safe, sufficient, and nutritious food at affordable prices. For us to achieve our mission, we need to think of farming in a different way, a way that would secure food for the current and the future generation. We are planning to achieve this through robust crop planning, which will be based on consumer and market demand insights heavily investing and driving new technology and modern farm management practices to optimize market needs, driving a new perspective on the future of our range diversity in our crop planning to address both the consumer and market changing needs, support our local farming through accessibility to farming inputs such as seeds, know-how and technology and access to market focusing more on technology enabled food supply and production. It is not worthy to mention that while it is not easy to grow food sustainably in desert, yet the agriculture sector in the UAE has seen rapid growth in recent years, driven by new farm technique solution. Therefore, I would like to highlight one of the key drivers that will enable us at Silal to achieve our mission which is how to leverage technology in production and supply chain processes. We are currently contracting with almost 800 farms by increasing their production volume by offering certainty through fixed prices and variety of crops in line with the national food security strategy. The key question is how to achieve this in an economical and sustainable manner. That's why we need to apply innovative agri-technologies that will not only increase yield, but also reduce water consumption and increase crop variety and maintain production all year round. The first step is to understand and eliminate the challenges in growing some of the usually imported produce. We know that with the controlled environment farming such as high-tech greenhouses and indoor farms were able to grow wide variety of crops in the UAE. 
However, in order to do this in a commercially feasible manner, we will source technologies that will increase water efficiencies, reduce pesticide usages, and increase crop productivity. This includes testing the feasibility of different variety of fruits and vegetables. That's why we are looking at solution and precision agriculture, smart farm equipment, modern irrigation techniques, and seed technology, which looks at the genotyping of seeds to customize solution to our local environment. We are not only studying technologies that will support the farming, but also our entire value chain from farms to consumers. For example, we are building geo-mapping tools that will enable the most efficient transport, chilling and delivery of the farmer's produce. From a sales point of view, we are developing system that will integrate farms with sales channels to increase market access for farmers. One key enabler that will help us in achieving our mission is to create an R&D ecosystem through local and global partnership that will enable knowledge transfer, sustainability, and innovation. I'm very confident that with the support of the leadership of the UAE, the local and federal government stakeholders and private sectors, our team will work collaboratively with the different stakeholders across the entire value chain to overcome any challenge that comes our way. This was demonstrated earlier this year when the world witnessed disruption in the global food supply chain during COVID-19. The UAE was able to maintain the price level of the food items and fill any shortage in the market. We count on the private sector to leverage on the experience and capabilities from local producer, logistic partners, distribution channels, and retailers to meet the national food security goals. We are also forging international partnership with the global institution that have built proven food technologies which can be deployed locally. This will allow us to increase the availability of a wide variety of local fresh produce for the people of the UAE. At the end, I would like to thank you all for taking the time to be here with us today. We look forward to working hand in hand with you all to achieve the national food security goals. Together, we can secure food for all. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is a pleasure to be speaking before you today, and I find myself delighted to have the opportunity to join His Excellency Jamal Salam al in discussion on the importance of technology-enabled food supply and production. Today, the UAE imports 90% of its food from abroad and therefore is dependent on these imports for national security. Achieving food security has been a strategic objective that sits on the UAE's agenda for decades. Its goals were crystallized in 2018 with the launch of the UAE's National Strategy for Food Security. As we gradually emerge from the global pandemic and its wide-ranging impacts on global trade, commerce, and transport, we are provided with an even stronger impetus to innovate, develop, and advance the UAE's local agriculture industry. What I and my partners at Rainmakers have invested in is the next generation of agriculture technology that will add macroeconomical value to the UAE and transform our nation from one that imports the majority of its food to one that efficiently, sustainably and reliably produces the bulk of what its citizens and residents need. Rainmakers is an entrepreneurial catalyst that is working to build a sustainable ecosystem in support of the UAE's national strategy
for food security. Through a joint venture with Grow Group from the Netherlands, we have launched our first initiative in creating Green Factory Emirates. Green Factory Emirates will build and operate the largest indoor farm in the world, right here in Abu Dhabi, and become a major food production player in the UAE and globally. It is our intention to build similar farms in the region to boost the local production capacity. Our focus will remain to leverage the indoor farming technologies to produce at scale where climate conditions are a challenge. With a total project value of more than 650 million dirhams, our farm will be built on a plot of 17 hectares and include cultivation area of 160,000 square meters, 20 times larger than any other project announced in the UAE. It will have the capacity to grow over 50 different types of crops and production will be driven by market demand. By the end of the farm's six development phases, we will produce over 10,000 tons of fresh produce per year. One of our strategic partners would be Levart, a major food distributor based out from the Netherlands, and will be operating in the UAE to ensure 100% of the offtake and for the distribution of our farm output. Looking beyond production, we are proud of the innovations at the heart of Green Factory Emirates. The farm will grow high quality vegetables with 100% pesticide free all year round, while simultaneously using 95% less water than traditional cultivation methods and having a 40% lower carbon footprint. In addition, the Green Factory Emirates will host and build an R&D facility developed in partnership with the world's leading universities for agriculture and forestry, such as Wageningen University, Delphi, and MIT. My team and I are proud and humbled to be part of the Green Factory Emirates project and are looking forward to working with numerous stakeholders to make it a success. As it stands, we hope to have finished the first phase of the project by October 2021, just in time for the beginning of Dubai Expo. Rainmakers has for mission to participate in developing sustainably infrastructures projects at scale that will allow the UAE to become more resilient and to achieve complete food security. Food security is a global concern. As population grows, and arable land is becoming more scarce, it is crucial that we start leveraging our resources as well as technologies towards becoming better at growing food in arid climates. We believe that by starting the process with existing and proven methods and technologies deployed on a large scale production facilities, we will not only contribute to growing more crops locally, but also in creating more opportunities to innovate as we will be using our farms for production as well as R&D sandboxes. This approach follows and supports the UAE government strategy to lead the next generations of agriculture technicians and to export both successes and talents globally in order to ensure food abundance for generations to come. It was a pleasure to be speaking before you today and I would like to thank all the attendees and participants. I look forward to meeting and speaking with many of you over the course of this event. Thank you. Thank you both for such a remarkable session. Now we will start our third session entitled Virtual Connections to Expand Trade Channels and Support Growing New Businesses, which will be delivered by His Excellency Muhammad Ahlal Al Mahiri, Director General of Abu Dhabi Chamber. Good day. I'm pleased to speak about the most prominent in the global food market event, CL Middle East. Abu Dhabi is proud to have successfully hosted this event since 2010, bringing together food experts and industry leaders from around the region and world to collaborate and exchange ideas on food, beverages, and hospitality. Despite the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, the food sector has shown great levels of resilience and flexibility. As the voice and supporter of the private sector, the Abu Dhabi Chamber is fully committed to supporting CR Middle East. The event 
will present opportunities in FMB sector for businesses in Abu Dhabi, creating global opportunities that can support our government's strategic objectives of enhancing food security to build more sustainable economy and environment. Over the years, Sian Middle East has continued to gain more recognition and has become a leading and global platform for food industry leaders to explore the latest in food technologies. Considering the exceptional circumstances we are living today, Sial Middle East is going virtual, bringing FMB suppliers from around the world through an interactive digital agenda. The virtual event has adapted the new norm and aims to help FMB companies navigate through these challenging times by providing a platform to present the latest innovations in the FMB industry. This is also important to small and medium enterprises in Abu Dhabi, who the Abu Dhabi Chamber is a prime supporter of. SMEs will have the opportunity to explore local and international best practices while giving the opportunity to present their innovations in the FMB sector. The food industry is the second biggest economic sector in the United Arab Emirates. It is expected that food consumptions in the country will increase to 59.2 million tons by 2025. This solidifies Abu Dhabi's strong economic position in the region thanks to the advanced legislative structure which revolves around growing and expanding businesses, especially in food and beverages. We wish Seal Middle East all the success in helping businesses create new partnerships and uncover investment opportunities in this key sector and wish you all good health and prosperity. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, such an encouraging speech on the future trade plans in the UAE. Now, we will hear on date production and export from local traditions to worldwide expertise, delivered by His Excellency, Dr. Abdel Wahab Zayed, Secretary General, Khalifa International Award for Date Palm and Agriculture Innovation. Please join me in welcoming His Excellency. Dear respected excellencies, distinguished guests, and date palm growers, I am delighted to meet all of you today as a speaker through this virtual platform, CL Middle East 2020. Khalifa International War for Date Palm and Agricultural Innovation is honored to carry the name of His Highness Sheikh Khalifa bin Zayed Al Nahyan President of UAE, may God protect him. The award also receives the care of His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, Deputy Supreme Commander of the UAE Armed Forces. The award also received the support, the continuous support of His Highness Sheikh Mansour bin Zayed Al Nahyan, UAE Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Presidential Affairs. And also, there is a close follow-up of His Highness Sheikh Nahyan Mbarak and Nahyan, Minister of Tolerance and Coexistence, President of the Award Board of Trustees. We are proud of all the awards achievement in developing the infrastructure of the date palm cultivation and production sector, locally, regionally, and internationally through a series of date palm festivals. The award organized so far 10 international festivals in several Arab countries, such as the Arab Republic of Egypt, the Republic of Sudan, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, and several other countries. Dear distinguished guests, it is a pleasure for us in the General Secretariat of the Khalifa Award 
to have a strategic partnership with the Abu Dhabi National Exhibition Company, ADNEC. Together, we will organize the Abu Dhabi International Dead Palm Exhibition. The UAE was able to achieve self-sufficiency in the availability of dates decades ago, as it stands actually now in a position that UAE exports locally produced date to various countries. The UAE now is ranked among the top countries in terms of exporting rates, which reached 58% of the amount of produced dates in the UAE. Today, dates are considered as an important element of the global food security equation by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, FAO. Dear distinguished guest, today, the date palm sector is receiving a well-deserved strategic position worth almost two billion US dollars, of which Tunisia is getting about 16%, while Saudi Arabia and the UAE are getting 10% each of this amount. And these data are according to FAO trade statistics. At the end, please allow me to welcome participants from all countries to this virtual session of the CIAL Middle East Exhibition 2020. We would like to welcome exhibitors, date palm growers, producers, manufacturers, and buyers who are participating in the Abu Dhabi International Virtual Date Palm Exhibition from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the Arab Republic of Egypt, the Republic of Sudan, the Kingdom of Morocco, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, Mauritania, and the host country, United Arab Emirates. Wishing you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, for sharing your knowledge. Our fifth session is titled Entrepreneurship and Develop Thriving and Competitive SMEs in the UAE, which will be delivered by the Executive Director of Outreach Sector at the Khalifa Fund for Enterprise Development, Mr. Mubarak Al-Amri. Please join me in welcoming him. Good afternoon, distinguished guests. My name is Mubarak Al-Amri and I'm the Executive Director of the Outreach Management Division of Khalifa Fund for Enterprise Development. The leading SME economic development entity in the region that is dedicated to supporting the growth, guidance, and developing of SMEs in the UAE. It is my pleasure to be speaking with you today on the topic of entrepreneurship and developing thriving and competitive SMEs in the UAE. At its very essence, Khalifa Fund is an organization that constantly works towards developing and implementing innovative solutions that will enhance the UAE's SME sector and make it a thriving and competitive ecosystem. The SME sector is a major contributor to our economy, who represent 98% of Abu Dhabi's businesses, an attribute for around 29% of the Emirates GDP. When you consider these figures, you cannot deny the integral role that SMEs play in both our economy and overall community. The SME sector provides our economy with key financial contributions that are part of the diversification policy, whilst manufacturing to retail and FMB are some of the priority sectors highlighted by the government of Abu Dhabi. It is undeniable that the FMB industry is incredibly important to the UAE's economy. With a total consumer spend of 92 billion dirhams on food and drink, and a large contribution to the retail and wholesale sector, which accounts for 12% of the UAE's GDP. The manufacturing of FMB products is also a key factor to our local economy. The average investments per unit accumulates to 50 million dirhams. Meanwhile, there are 650 factories in the UAE that are dedicated to the production of FMB products. 
At Khalifa Fund, we constantly aim to enhance the UAE imperative FMB sector. To date, Khalifa Fund has financed loans amounting of 190 million dirhams to the FMB projects and currently have 218 FMB registered applicants in the FMB sector. We aim to continue this effort by empowering more businesses in this sector with the objective of developing UAE organizations that enhance our local and the global economy. A prime example is Danat, a UAE-owned and operated enterprise that exports their traditional UAE foods, spices, and herbal medicines to countries around the world, including Bahrain, Italy, Kuwait, Oman, Saudi Arabia, and Seychelles. Furthermore, the FMB sector positions itself among the top strategic sectors in the UAE. Currently, the UAE is putting additional emphasis on the FMB sector and local food production to enhance the country's food security levels and maintain its position as one of the world's leading agri-tech and food security regions. The UAE, led by the Emirate Food Security Council, is making efforts to create a sustainable food security structure by reducing the country's environmental footprint across the entire value chain. In alignment with these efforts, Khalifa Fund has actively supported innovative food production in the UAE through our Zar'i program, which has seen Khalifa Fund provide over 88 million dirhams of financing to 88 farmers that use innovative water technology. Khalifa Fund remains committed to the strategy of investing into emerging markets and providing them with groundbreaking solutions to imperative goals, such as food security and local food production. However, currently only 10.5% of the UAE's needs are met through local food production. Unfortunately, the local food production industry has faced unprecedented challenges during the early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic, from disruption of supply chain to travel restrictions and lockdowns. However, the FMB sector and local food production industry alike showed great resilience in the UAE and we recall His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed's wise leadership directives and his inspiring message when he stated that medicine and food will be in infinite supply for our communities. Moving forward, I believe that Khalifa Fund's current strategy of securing partnerships, developing new FMB manufacturing ventures and creating training programs will contribute to the increase of Abu Dhabi's local production rates. Currently, Khalifa Fund are in advanced talks to work in cohesion with leading manufacturers, where we will vet and connect them with talented entrepreneurs who strive to enhance the SME sector and local food production industry simultaneously through innovative solutions. Finally, I wish everyone in attendance an informative and engaging time during the FMB Networking Hub. And I would like to share my thanks to ADNIC for organizing this thought-provoking program of which I hope we can develop opportunities that will further enhance our FMB sector and empower local food producers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Al Amri. We will now begin with our sixth session titled Food Security and Geoeconomic Assertiveness, which will be delivered by Hayeko Porchard, Managing Director of Porchard Consulting and Research AG. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hayeko. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address your conference. 
This conference comes at an important point in time as we are witnessing the dawn of a new period in economic globalization. As we are still living through the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic, but also given um, the long-term consequences of the spring 2020 oil price shock, it is becoming increasingly obvious that globalization is vulnerable. The vulnerability of globalization is an important issue to deal with from the perspective of a country like the United Arab Emirates. Unlike many other countries, the UAE has mastered the art of tapping into strategic flows such as the exchange, the unrestricted exchange of capital, goods, services, data, and also the free movement of people. Um, surfing on these strategic flows has enabled the UAE to become a hub of globalization. But these strategic flows and the connectivity that comes with it are getting increasingly toxic. They're turning toxic because more and more governments understand that if you control strategic flows, you exert political and economic power. So flow control becomes the kind of a new strategic currency. But flow control can endanger food security. Flow control will affect access to countries of origin, transit and destination. Flow control can influence the availability of technology. And flow control will increasingly shape political preferences to fund food-related infrastructure development projects. So if flow control is threatening food security, a country like the UAE needs to respond. Part of the response comes with the National Food Security Strategy 2051. That strategy underlines the need for global cooperation in food trade, and it also looks into specific issues such as the need for proper food security governance models. I would, however, suggest that in order to deal with the challenges of flow control in the food sector, the UAE should implement its strategy on food security with a proper food diplomacy agenda. The food diplomacy agenda I'm suggesting would consist of six different elements. First, food security should become a standing topic in bilateral and multilateral discussions. Putting food security at the top of your diplomatic agenda will enhance discussions on improving a mutual understanding of the challenges that might affect food security and also discussions about possible mitigation options. Building on this strategic dialogue, the second element um, I'm proposing are joint risk assessments that look into all political, economic, technical, environmental and societal risks along food supply chains, downstream and upstream, including all public and private partners. This is something that we are lacking these days and pushing joint risk assessments towards this goal would be extremely beneficial for regional and pan-regional food security. Based on joint risk assessments, the third element then consists of the idea of establishing so-called early warning mechanisms. These early warning mechanisms um, will enable all stakeholders to understand when food security is at risk. Um, early warning mechanisms are already under discussion among uh, the six Gulf Cooperation Council members, but I think there are many reasons why such an initiative should be extended beyond the Arab Gulf region to include critical food partners such as Northern African countries, countries at the Horn of Africa, countries in Central um, Asia or in the greater Asia Pacific region. The fourth element that um, should be included in a food diplomacy agenda is science and technology cooperation. Science and technology cooperation, on the one hand, is important to attract talent to the UAE, and the UAE has already launched different initiatives to achieve this goal, among others a, um, a technology challenge 
that tries to also attract inventions and startups to the UAE. But there's more than only attracting talent. I think uh, the Emirates will also need to double up their efforts into establishing a national science and technology base that will enable you also to share your expertise with other partners along the food supply chain. So if you look, for example, into areas like unmanned aerial systems, cybersecurity, or even space-based reconnaissance, these are three technology examples where the UAE has, for national security purposes, already built up indigenous science and technology capabilities that could be pulled through from national security to food security, thus also opening up new avenues for cooperation with partners. Once we talk about science and technology cooperation, we should also talk about the fifth element, and that's standardization. Again, two groups of standards need to be taken into account. Technology-oriented standards are needed to shape markets. This is extremely important. The more we digitize the food supply chain, the more we will need to look into issues like cybersecurity, data sovereignty, and data protection. In addition to technology-driven standards and standards shaping technology development, there's another area that is becoming increasingly important. And these are standards dealing with societal expectations. More and more governments want food production to take into account um, environmental aspects. We want to respect labor rights and countries also want to get to know to what extent, for example, um, food production is enlarging their CO2 footprint. So the investment community is increasingly looking into so-called ESG criteria, environmental, societal and governance criteria to shape their investment priorities. By combining standards for food-related ESG um, investments with the Emirati food diplomacy agenda, the, Emir the Emirates could become a major driver in readjusting future investment priorities. However, all of these elements in the end, and that's the sixth element, depend on food supply chain management. And this is where flow control comes in. Flow control, in the end, is about reshaping supply chains in the food se sector, but also in other industry sectors. So proper food security in the future will require proper food supply chain management. But there are different challenges to achieve this goal. In particular, there's a challenge because supply chains lack transparency. Um, supply chain partners might be aware of their immediate interlocutors, but beyond this immediate relationships, supply chains very quickly turn very dark. So um, I'm proposing as a um, overall umbrella for the food diplomacy agenda, a multilateral initiative on food supply chain transparency. Every supply chain consists of three elements. First, the physical layer, which brings together all assets required to produce, store, transport and disseminate food. Second, the data layer, because at every stage of the food supply chain, um, actors generate data, but data remains siloed so far. And the third um, layer is liquidity, that's the payment flows. Now, the problem is, as long as data remains siloed, there will be hardly any advancements with regard to um, supply chain transparency. The second problem is that liquidity is unequally distributed along the food supply chain. So tier one actors have relatively easy access to liquidity at preferential rates, whereas individual farmers at, um, at the bottom of the supply chain only have scarce access to liquidity. So the multilateral food supply chain transparency initiative 
would combine two aspects. Liquidity flows in return for data to be shared. So as soon as a actor along the food supply chain complies with specific requirements, let's say in terms of environmental protection or meeting halal food standards, this would trigger instant liquidity flows. And the liquidity flow is tied to verifying compliance with requirements based on data. So all of a sudden, data is getting a price tag and data is valorized and that's why there will be an incentive to share data. This initiative um, will require the UAE to reach out to different stakeholders. On the public side, the UAE might want to work with different international organizations such as FAO in Rome or the Islamic Development Bank, which itself is looking into um, supporting projects to advance um, value chains. And on the private sector side, the UAE will need to work with companies that um, help uh, set up a open and federated and also technology agnostic ecosystem for every partner of the food supply chain to tap into. A kind of communitarian approach will be needed um, to advance a dynamic that is um, favorable to data sharing rather than beefing up the position of individual uh, platform owners. Such an initiative will also put the UAE in the driver's seat uh, to com combine data and liquidity to advance the uh, sustainable development goals of the United Nations. So let me sum up. As globalization becomes increasingly toxic, flow control is the new name of the game. Flow control is detrimental to food security. In response, the UAE should launch a food diplomacy agenda that is in particular meant to advance a multilateral regime to improve transparency along food supply chains. This initiative builds on two core strengths of the UAE, financial power on the one hand and technology savviness on the other hand. By linking liquidity with the data throughout this multilateral initiative, the UAE could become a forerunner for a new diplomatic initiative that sits at the intersection of technology development, overseas development aid, and economic prosperity. And such an initiative would perfectly match the UAE's strategic ambition. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Porchert, for such a stimulating session. Now, we will start with our seventh session, Predicting Food and Beverage Trends the role of food exhibitions in supporting the agri-food sector, which will be delivered by Mr. Nicola Trantu, CEO of the CL Global Network. Hello, I'm so happy to be here with you today. Here, I mean, on the screen, of course. It would be so much better to be in Abu Dhabi with you and uh, share uh, together the excitement of the CL Middle East. But if we cannot gather together now, it does not mean that we should not prepare the future together. So it's a great honor for me to have a chance to speak with you today. Let me just remind you of uh, who we are and how we do contribute to the worldwide development of the food industry. So I'm Nicolas Tronceau, Managing Director of the Cial Network. Cial is already a well-established network of uh, food B2B events. It's actually the number one network with shows all over the world. The biggest event is well known as Cial Paris, it was launched over 50 years ago and has become the leading event with over 300,000 actors of the food industry coming from 200 countries. So Cial is not just about one show, but uh, it's a comprehensive network from Canada to China, from India to Indonesia, from Algeria to Middle East. So yes, we have this great Cial Middle East event. This is actually our teenage kid, which is now 10 years old. It's a great opportunity uh, to actually greet our local teams from Capital Events and ATNEC. And we do warmly thank them for organizing this event. Cial Middle East is one of the leading events in the GCC region for the food industry. It's all about food supply, food safety, food self-sufficiency, food sustainability, and more. It's a business platform, but it's also a great source of inspiration. 
and sharing for the global food community from farm to fork, from restaurant to retail. Inspire Food Business is a backbone of all our events with a clear focus on innovations and trends. Our approach is simple, three steps more or less. One is about presenting uh, an in-depth analysis of the current trends reflecting consumption today. Two is about anticipating the future by picking up on weak signals. And three, of course, it's about sharing and training the food community to allow them to become the enlightened actors of those changes. So it's good to speak about Cial, but you are certainly eager to hear about the market and the worldwide uh, food challenges we are facing. So let's try to draw the global frame first, because we look deeper at trends. Global food ambition for the coming decades is very clear and needs to meet three key objectives. One is food needs to be healthy. I want to protect my health. Two, uh, food needs to be sustainable. I want to protect my environment and I want to make sure food supply will last, of course. Three, food needs uh, to be widely available um, for all, meaning meeting the needs of the coming 10 billion consumers on Earth. This means quantity, but also affordability. So you see, the challenge is pretty serious. And it's important that we all contribute and anticipate the way we can tackle those requirements. The food transition is a continuous process and has started a few years back already. So the focus of today will be to understand where we are in this transition process, to understand what we are going to eat tomorrow and what about after tomorrow. And finally, have a quick word on COVID. How much is it impacting our consumption today? And will it have a long lasting effect? So many questions we have tried to answer via global consumer research with XTC, Kantar and Jira. And I will try to give you a highlight, both from a global worldwide perspective, but also from a more regional perspective with a clear focus on UAE. So the first global insight, is really that the consumers are pushing for a change. They are well aware of the challenges. They are putting pressure on the industry to act on those challenges. But more importantly, consumers are now in action. They actually are changing their consumer habits to actively seek for healthy, sustainable food. So just one number, 73% of consumers have already changed their eating behaviors in the last couple of years. It's very important change from wishful thinking to actually clear action. So the deep motiv motivation of consumers is on one hand generous, philanthropic. They want to save the planet and the people. But on the other hand, they are also worried for themselves. There are fears. 69% of consumers think that their current diet could actually pose a health risk. And this is a rising concern worldwide with a clear kind of acceleration due to the current pandemic. So this explains why consumers are becoming a lot more activist about food. You are what you eat. By making your own food choices, you are choosing the world you want to live in. If you have, you have the power to take actions and actually influence the food suppliers. So key question, of course, is now what do they want to, where do they want to go? What do they want to see in their plate? So we have identified four pillars, four pillar trends guiding our consumers today. Pleasure, health, simplicity, and meaning. So first one, first trend is pretty basic, or should I say essential, food needs to be good. It might sound silly to say the obvious, but it's not that silly. Food is pleasure. You want to please yourself. You want to please your loved ones. So no matter how healthy, how convenient, how green, if food is no good, there will be no repurchase. So please never lose track of pleasure when we speak about food. Second trend, health, of course. As stated before, consumers are more and more concerned about their health. This is the second tier of the Maslow hierarchy of needs, the safety needs. Consumer needs reassurance, and they make a much closer link between their health and what they eat. Now, third trend, simplicity, natural goodness, back to basics. This is a key answer to provide reassurance. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Nothing so new as this statement actually belongs to Leonardo da Vinci. So what's behind simplicity? Transparency and clear commitments from suppliers. No more black box. Shorter ingredient list, trustworthy, well-identified ingredients, less additives, more natural products, and also less transformation. So organic products 
are a good flagship to illustrate these trends. A resounding yes to proximity in all its forms, and there are actually many. Local products, special proximity, local production, local distribution. Seasonal products, so more temporal proximity. Shorter distribution chain, meaning less intermediation, shorter access to farmers and producers. And interesting to mention that actually digitalization is actually enabling a lot of those direct contacts. So fourth key pillar to really capture the consumer's expectation is linked with meaning and the growing activism of consumers. Consumers do care about the impact of their own consumption on social and environmental systems. They do value clear commitments from producers. Things like fair price to farmers, clear sustainable production, or guarantee to protect animal welfare are becoming very convincing USPs for sure. So here we go. Four key trends driving consumer demand, pleasure, health, simplicity, and commitments. This is very coherent with the 2018 research identifying taste, true, and meaning as key drivers. Interesting to point out that truth and meaning are still very much growing at a fast pace. So the call to action, hopefully, is very clear for all producers. And the good news is that consumers and producers are sharing the same ambition and the same priorities. So the ecosystem is very much aligned with a good understanding and recognition of the progress already delivered to achieve the well-expected transition. So it's a good and collective constructive mindset. I'm already running out of time, but I still would like to address two more topics, regional key specificities and COVID impact. Well, I promised you earlier on a quick highlight on regional trend. Well, global trends are pretty much global by definition, so they much, very much apply to the region. Interesting to see that consumer trends are very consistent across the world. However, I can share with you a few hot numbers for the region. Two thirds of the regional population, 66%, is on board with the idea that food is a civil act as it is growing, so the world you want to live in. 78% have already changed their consumption behaviors. 71% more specifically to go for healthy food. Even three out of seven consumers believe they have managed to make radical choices to really protect ethic, environment, or animal welfare in the last couple of years. 84% of consumers acknowledge great effort of the food chain to achieve the transition. And of course, they want even more action for the future towards reduction of pesticides, reduction of controversial ingredients, growing focus on organic food and animal welfare, and something quite important for the UAE with 90% you know, of food imported is about reducing food waste and packaging. So now, before we can conclude, let's review the impact of COVID on worldwide food consumption. So short term, the impact on consumer behavior is quite drastic, and we can clearly point out four significant changes or threats to the industry. So the first one is the most visible change with a switch from Horeca channel to retail and home delivery. We can only feel very sorry for uh, most hotels and restaurants. Uh, they are very badly impacted by the confinement measures and the drastic slowdown of tourism, of course. Two is a significant impact on the import-export business due to travel limitations and cancellation of most trade events. Three is a drawback on packaging reduction, hygiene constraints and home delivery is generating a lot of plastic. So we know we have to focus on alternative packaging to better protect the environment. Four is the impact on purchasing power. The health crisis will no doubt lead to an economic crisis. So we have to expect growing demand for low price. Consumers short term will probably have to put on hold their aspiration for more qualitative healthy offerings. Sad to say that under pressure, consumers will clearly arbitrate in the following order. One is pleasure and fullness two is health, three is social environment, and finally is uh, really environment. So we have to accept that when times are getting harder, people naturally tend to refocus on individual needs. And so yes, there will be a short-term drawback on the philanthropic approach for a better world. Now, if we step back and look at the medium term, the pandemic will actually reinforce even more the importance of health and therefore the importance of better food for better health. So it will reinforce the pressure consumers will put on pure producers to offer transparency, clean label, more local products, and so on. So we can be actually quite confident that the consumer will quickly 
reactivate the ambition for healthier food, better for me, better for the people around me, better for the environment. So let's conclude with some positive thinking. The food transition is well on track. The challenge is clear and accepted. So let's just do it because it's simply good for the planet, good for health, and also good for our pleasure and pride. So let's own the change together. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Mr. Nicola Trantou, for your valued comments on the future trends and developments of the sector. We will now begin with the eighth session on the hospitality sector, which will be delivered by Mr. Jonathan Dawes, Executive Director of Capital Hospitality. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Dawes. Good afternoon. I'm Jonathan Dawes, the Executive Director of Capital Hospitality, part of Adnet Services, a subsidiary of Adnet Group. Capital Hospitality was founded in 2016 as the exclusive in-house caterer for Abu Dhabi National Exhibition Centre and Al Ain Convention Centre, both ADNEC group venues. Over the years, as the Capital Hospitality brand became further established, we expanded to provide services off-site for corporate and high-profile events, such as sporting events like the Abu Dhabi Formula One Grand Prix and UFC. Our offering now includes all varieties of catering services on and off site, from private events to gatherings and high end hospitality and government offices, with off site operations now accounting for around 20 to 30% of our total sales mix. I'd like to take some time to explain about how the business has been impacted by the pandemic, how we adapted to change to deal with the situations that arose, what we learned and the outlook for the future. Before the pandemic hit, we were on track for an outstanding year because of the sheer volume of events that were taking place in our venues. Another record year was on the horizon. We all know about the global effect that the pandemic has had on the catering and hospitality sector, more specifically, the restaurant and event catering markets. Lockdowns locally, nationally, and globally shut hospitality and non-essential businesses. Large events, including weddings and sporting events, were either postponed or took place without visitors. This was the catalyst that led us to completely transform our business model. Once confirmed that events were cancelled across Abu Dhabi from mid-March until further notice, it was clear that we needed to take swift action, adapt to the situation and diversify our offer. Capital Hospitality is a key employer of staff and contributor to the local economy and our top priority was to protect our workforce. Given that our business was primarily geared toward the catering event industry, we expected to see orders come to a complete standstill, modelling for these difficult situations. We certainly weren't expecting to see continued orders from our clients in the government sectors in the volumes that we did. We saw a huge demand for thousands of meals a day for medical staff, frontline workers, as well as patients at the, at the ADNIC venues, which like so many large exhibition centers around the world had been converted into a field hospital. It wasn't just healthcare workers, frontline emergency workers also had requirements for thousands of meals across the Emirate, remote and within the city. As you can imagine, this was an extremely different offer to the usual fork buffets and canapes we provided. However, we effectively adapted our menu offers and our on-site equipment within our kitchens in both Abu Dhabi and Alain. This enabled us to diversify into a high volume food service provider within a matter of weeks. Whilst these contracts were a lifeline, they also brought a variety of challenges. We had to pivot from our core offering of premium event and hospitality catering to high volume, nutritious, pre-packaged meals for a range of audiences from frontline emergency workers, healthcare professionals and those undergoing self-isolation. Some clients had requirements for simple bagged meals, whilst others demanded several courses of hot meals, which put our culinary team to the test to devise menus to suit all needs. The entire team was under an immense amount of pressure to deliver. The volumes of meals per day went from 20,000 pre-pandemic to an average of 80,000 meals per day during peak weeks testing not only the kitchen production, but also our logistics and supply chain network. 
As you'd expect, safety is our top priority. We've placed an additional layer of safety protocols for our supply chain, personnel and delivery based on local government guidelines. The increased demand required additional positions, which resulted in recruitment at the height of the pandemic. This included additional health and safety staff, ensuring all protocols were consistently being followed from supply chain to delivery. Our duty of care to staff is not only in the workplace, but also at our staff accommodation facilities. We relocated some of the human resources team to the company's accommodation, providing access to well-being, guidance, medical and mental health support. Many of the team found themselves with families in tough personal situations back home, so it was pertinent to increase support structures for them. There were huge demands on our supply chain and we quickly realised that internal processes and procedures for procurement needed to readapt. Our standard procurement process for new suppliers can take up to three months and where feasible, we reduce this to a three day turnaround whilst not compromising on quality or safety standards. Streamlining our processes gave us the ability to buy required equipment or product for hot deliveries all across the Emirate, as far reaching as the Saudi and Amman borders. We had to be agile and adaptable to meet our demand. We had an enormous amount of support from Adnet Group leadership who are keen to ensure that we succeeded. Our kitchens were reconfigured, we bought new equipment and large parts of Adnec venues were redesignated as temporary meal packing and storage facilities. We also appreciated support from other divisions within Adnet Group. So, what did we learn? Agility, adaptability, and being able to think on our feet and not be afraid to adapt to a process that didn't work for us. Our clients trusted us to deliver a product that was outside of our core offering based on our relationship and our reputation. There was no way we were going to let them down. Let me introduce you to our two culinary leaders who pioneer the operational changes needed to deliver the new strategy. Our assistant director of culinary experience, Chef Mohammed Hamdan, and our executive chef, Philip Delang. Chef Philip, from a practical point of view, what did you have to do to change your operation and organisation within the kitchen to be able to deliver such an increase in demand from service? Once we'd established what the client's requirements were, we then went to supply chain to make sure those items were available in the marketplace. Due to the global situation, certain items have been stopped being imported. Based on that, our menus were written, confirmed by the clients, and then the hard work began. We then had to rearrange our kitchen structure where we have four main kitchens where we produce food. Each one we have a local and a pastry. These were then changed just to do batch cooking. Because of the sheer volume, we couldn't cook chill, we had to cook and send. So the chefs were then trained on how to focus on doing one job multiple times rather than doing a whole menu. So we broke down the menu to different sections to then produce those items. One would do rice, one would do a main course, one would do saluna. So it was a completely new way of cooking. And also there was the cook chill had been taken out. It was cook send. On the cook chill, we, uh, we had uh, a, new, a new problem to a new challenge. On the cook chill, we had a new challenge to get the food to arrive to the client all at the same time at the correct time. It was coming from four locations, from Malain and from Abu Dhabi, so we had to, our timings had to be in line to make sure we got it. So tell us about the pressure that your staff went through to be able to deliver that kind of volume of meals. Well, it was a completely different operation for them. They were used to coming in at a certain time, having function sheets where they could read, their, they'd know the days in advance what they'd be doing so they could plan the week, we'd plan it together. Now, or then what happened was, as you're aware, it was last minute, so we had to have a quick reaction time and to deliver the food. There were bulk volumes of food being cooked, so it was very monotonous at times, so we had to make sure the staff had enough nutrition themselves, and enough rest so they had a, the right mentality to do, the, to do the day. So they faced a lot of challenges. Physically, there were long days on their feet, 
and it was doing the repetitive movement each time because of the sheer volume of the feet. There weren't any little trays, it was all big pots, big trays, and oven fills of feet. And, and what about the testing procedures that the staff had to go through? So we, we had to have a, a clear test every 14 days, but it took up to four days for the results. So every 10 days, the staff would go in batches and they would be tested, and then, uh, yeah, every 10 days. So we all couldn't be on site. Even to go into the building, we, we, as we still do now, we have the sanitization tunnel, we have the temperature checks, we have the signs. So it, there was a process from the early days, from day one, was put in place, and we're still following those now. Also, our safety staff, they are working 24 hours with the clients to make sure everything went in a correct way. Chef Hamden, as a business, we pride ourselves and have built a reputation on our quality of our product and service. During the pandemic, we went from 20,000 meals up to 85,000 on certain days. How were you able to maintain the quality of our product and service throughout? And how did you relate and discuss with our customers throughout the process and maintain that customer satisfaction? So we have a very good communication between us and our client. So we keep it in a priority that one. So as at 24 hours, we have communicated with the client. So we check what he want, what his requirement and uh, what uh, their customer also uh, they want. Uh, we train our staff actually very, very, very good times we spend with them to teach them exactly how we're going to deliver to, to the client. And from, uh, from Capital Hospitality team, as all of the team, between uh, sales, uh, service, uh, account, HR, everyone we turn as a, all one part to deliver the food in a good quality to our clients. Uh, also, we send our staff, the senior staff, to the location to check uh, in the location the quality of the food, the timing, the heat, everything they check, even the HSEQ, they go there and they spot check our food in the location and keep talking with the client how's the food they, we deliver. So, And again, just in practical terms, how, how far in advance were the orders coming? Was it three days, four days in advance? And how often were you personally talking to clients throughout the pandemic? So that's the part where we are, uh, it's a funny for us actually. Before we having uh, two, three days to plan for the event. But in this situation, we having like three hours to deliver a thousand of meal in a different location, which is, it was uh, a really good uh, experience. We have it and our team, uh, they make their best to deliver the best food to the client, to make him happy and to make everyone happy. And, and gents, over the past six, seven, eight months, we're all incredibly proud of our teams to be uh, delivering what they did with the exceptional quality and service um, at, at the volumes that they were able to produce. Um, what is your biggest learning and, and takeaways from the past um, six months? The, the biggest learning in the uh, past six months, we reached to 85,000 meal per day uh, between breakfast, lunch and dinner, and plus uh, 16,000 as a snack sandwich meal. So we do it in on one day, which is uh, the number before we don't reach it, but uh, and a good teams and a good leaders we have that we reach to this point and we deliver and it's successful. And for, for me, it was the adaptability of the team. We were able to uh, make changes to the menus uh, when we were dealing with uh, the same client with the same the huge volume of food per day. It's very easy to become bored of the, uh, of the food. So when the clients made a request, our team was able to adapt straight away within three hours we could change the menu and send out a different food for the clients so we maintain their satisfaction. We never said no because whatever happens, the client's there, we have to feed them, so we should do it the best way we can. So, what's next for Capital Hospitality? The past few months have shown that there's clearly a demand in the local market for a high volume food service provider with an exceptional reputation for quality. Recently, we've launched a subsidiary food brand, Capital Kitchen, that concentrates on a number of targeted industry sectors.
The team have done exceptionally well, having diversified our offer, adapted to change, and we're all very excited about what the future holds. Thank you, Mr. Doz, for your session, extremely encouraging for the entire sector. For our final session, from field to fork, maintaining sustainability and highest food and drink quality standards in the supply chain, we welcome Mr. Youssef Ali, Chairman and Managing Director of Lulu Group International, and Mrs. Katagina Jajnicic, First Councillor, Representative of the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, Embassy of the Republic of Poland in Abu Dhabi. Please join me in welcoming our esteemed speakers. In the name of God, the most merciful, the most beneficent. Distinguished guests, dignitaries, industry leaders, speakers, participants, friends, and my dear brothers and sisters. First of all, let me thank ADNIC for joining hands with the DAFSA and other stakeholders for organizing first FNB networking hub in this CIL Middle East event. I am thankful to them for inviting me to be a part of this significant event and to speak along with other dignitaries. Friends, food and beverage industry is a significant and stable contributor to economies all around the world. The industry's activities usually generate substantial economic impact to the country. And this networking event is providing an opportunity for participants from all over the world to virtually meet and to find solutions to support the growth of this sector. Ladies and gentlemen, today, more than ever before, food products regularly cross national boundaries at various stage of supply chain. In United Arab Emirates, the regulators are making sure that these foods are safe and having the highest quality standards. 
as we all know sustainability means creating finance creating the financial value while protecting the environment and generating social value both within operations and along supply chain the farm to fork strategy will mobilize the food industry and retailers to increase the availability and affordability of healthy sustainable food options in the region brothers and sisters our group lulu group is a responsible retailer is committed to maintain sustainability and highest level of food safety standards in supply chain see when we discuss about food safety in the different countries we should also discuss about food security when we discuss about the food security we should also discuss about the food scarcity it is our collective responsibility to make sure that there is no food scarcity in the coming years friends more incentives should be given to farmers to encourage them to increase their production this will also help them to adopt biotechnology nanotechnology and other advanced and modern technologies to produce crops this is very very necessary we know that before farmers used to produce one seasonal crop in their farmlands annually in back home india we are seeing this. we were seeing this things have changed now and two to three seasonal crops are produced now in every year i believe that every retailer should commit to maintain sustainability and highest level of food safety standards in supply chain ladies and gentlemen to ensure best products and uninterrupted supply we have set up 15 sourcing offices our group 15 sourcing offices across the globe and our four sourcing office is in pipeline in different countries this is because we want our own procurement grading packing and quality control centers which can supply hygienic and best products from different parts of the world our well experienced and skilled sourcing team also gets all the products from approved suppliers in each region sir we also have our own state of the art production facilities for meat vegetable and commodities to ensure quality and hygiene this is to ensure the highest quality products to our customers maintaining the quality and the standard of our in-house prepared foods is equally important to us we use the best quality ingredients and follow good manufacturing and hygiene practices across all our outlets uh, during this pandemic the trend is for ready cooked foods we are also promoting this trend by providing high quality ingredients for our customers to cook we are using all modern state of art high quality equipment for storing processing manufacturing in all our outlets when it comes to our private label product we make sure that our suppliers have a strong food safety management system in place accountability should be there these are audited by our internal food safety auditors and independent third party auditors to ensure the quality this pandemic situation has also made us to strengthen our e-commerce for effective transportation of e-commerce we have made a huge investment in fleet management this is to ensure that the products do not lose its quality when it reaches our customers sir i am proud as well as humbled to say that we have received many awards from different authorities across the region nationally and internationally this shows our commitment 
to bring in the food safety standards and practices wherever we operate. In today's highly competitive business world, customer is the key. Customer satisfaction is very important to the growth and success of all, any business, including our business. Quality, safety, and efficiency of the product are the signs of excellence. This equally important to sustain the faith of our customers. I sincerely believe that the food safety is a shared responsibility of producers, suppliers, regulators, and retailers, and every consumer. Let me once again thank Adnik for organizing this networking event, and I wish this event all success, and thank you. Thank you very much. We expanded not in, in a very fast time. We expanded since now 43 years I'm here. Our expansion is very slow, steady. At the time of Gulf War, some people thought to stay in this part of the world is difficult. So I decided to start the biggest hypermarket at that time. Good afternoon and greetings from the Polish Embassy, the Polish Ministry of Agriculture and welcome to Poland. Because of the pandemic, we are unable to host you this year at our national pavilion at Sial Middle East in Abu Dhabi. So I would like to extend a special thank you to Sial organizers and Abu Dhabi team to make it possible for us to take part in this very important networking event. So, welcome to a virtual trip through Poland. 
Now you can see the agenda of my speech. Firstly, I would like to present a brief overview of the Polish agri-food industry and the position on this sector in the world and in the European Union. Next, leading F&B products, which are appreciated by customers worldwide in the MENA region and in the UAE. Then the Polish main partner in regards to the F&B business in my country. Finally, I am going to present a short video about Polish story of Cial 2019 to show you how we miss your presence at our stand. Let's, let's start with a few words about my country, stressing the power of tradition and the value of the agri-sector for the national economy. Poland is a medium-sized Central European country. It occupies the sixth place in the EU, both in terms of population and the area. Thanks to our soil and climate conditions and many years of tradition in farming and food processing, Poland is one of the European leading producers and exporters of food and agri-products. The Polish population amounts to 38 million people, of whom about 50 million inhabit rural areas. Thus, Poland is the third largest EU member in terms of people employed in agri-sector and second in terms of number of agriculture holdings. Global value of agricultural holdings production place Polish farming at seventh place in the EU. In terms of food production, Poland is the sixth largest food producer in the EU with a value share of around 9%. The sector consists of 60,000 companies employing 400,000 people. The food market in my country constitutes 21% of the sale value of the entire domestic industry. So, agriculture and F&B sector mean in my country nature, flavors, mostly multi-generational family farming, well-equipped manufacturing, responsibility for food security at environment, and significant contribution to the GDP. Thus, in 2019, agriculture, food and related industries contributed about 250 billion dirhams to the Polish GDP, which states for 9% share. The essential part plays meat, poultry, beef and pork, because of our rich tradition in breeding. The dairy industry ranks the second position with share of 12%. The next position take grain products. Polish confectionery products are present in more than 130 countries worldwide. Moreover, Polish honey is increasingly popular in foreign markets. Talking about our production and export winning products, we can't forget Polish apples, because apples are our national treasure. We are the largest producer of fresh apples in the European Union and the third largest in the world. Moreover, it is one of the most popular Polish export commodities. As you know, fruit from trees has a rich taste of nature, so we organize a lot of promotion events, especially among our, our little ones, like you can see in the photo in intercity trains. In addition, we are the second global producer of concentrated apple juice. However, apples are not the only that matter. We are also an European and global leader in the production of other fresh and frozen fruits and vegetables. Summarizing, here is the breakdown of subsectors in terms of production value. Let's move on to the Polish exports. I am proud to say that Polish food is in a great demand globally. We have been ranked as a 17th largest global food exporter. The chart presents the geographic structure of our export of agri-food products. Last year, we shipped out products worth about 32 billion euros, where 82% accounted for the EU market. And even in difficult conditions surrounding the ongoing pandemic, we are recording a constant increase in our export. 
In the first half of this year, it amounted to 16.4 billion euros. In terms of export to MENA region, we sold agri projects worth about 1.60 billion euros. And one of the key importers in MENA is Saudi Arabia, where last year the value of export was worth about 30 million, 300 million euros, which constitutes about 1% of our total agri export with a significant annual increase by 9%. We have also recorded rising trends in exports to Egypt, Morocco, Syria and the UAE. Moving on to the UAE market, last year we shipped out food products worth 71 million euros. And here you can see the commodity structure. On the whole, the leading role play grain and graining products, followed by confectionery and dairy products. This year, we indicate also a significant increase, increase in exports to the UAE market. And now, during the pandemic, the strategic stock, stock uh, uh, procurements are playing essential role to support national food security. Thus, the highest growth was recorded in two leading industries, grain and dairy products. However, we still see a great potential in development of the bilateral trade. And we would like to supply more, especially fresh fruit like apples and meat and also frozen food. Now, because today we are attending a networking event, let me introduce you to the main Polish partner in terms of food producers and suppliers. National Support Center for Agriculture named COVR, it is an acronym of Polish name, is a governmental um, agency subordinate to Polish Ministry of Agriculture. If you are looking for business partners or for particular products, please contact COVR. They are food kin experts and will help you with absolutely everything free of charge that is related to the industry. Together with the Polish companies, they are attending the leading food exhibitions worldwide, including CIAL. So, this slide presents only a few pictures of our activities at CIAL events in Canada, Paris and Abu Dhabi. Uh, we get a lot of reports that Polish exhibitors are happy with joining all those events and appreciate the work and commitment of CIAL organizers. I hope I was able to convince you that we in Poland understand food not only as a vital export product, but also as an important part of our cultural identity. Hopefully, we will be able to host you in the next Real Seal Middle East 2021. And now I will present two minutes video about the edition in 2019. Please enjoy the Polish hospitality and thank you for your attention. Hello. 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 Polska kuchnia i wołowina podbija Bliski Wschód. Nasze produkty wzbudzają ogromne zainteresowanie.
Thank you both Mr. Ali and Mrs. Jajnijic for providing us with such valuable insights. Finally, we welcome Mr. Dirar al Manasir, Director of Strategy Management and Excellence at the Abu Dhabi National Exhibition Company. Mr. Manasir will deliver the closing remarks for the first ever FMB Networking Hub. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to thank all of you for your participation in the FNB Networking Hub by Seattle Middle East, eSummit and meetings. This year has presented its challenges for the food global industry. Yet, out of COVID-19 pandemic, the food, beverage and hospitality sector has shown its continued vitality in the global economy. As we now look toward the end of the pandemic, industry collaboration is crucial to understand how we can emerge stronger as a sector. That is why holding events such as the FNB Networking Hub by Siyan Middle East is so important. Today, we have heard from leaders in the sector speak on the continued importance of the food and beverage sector and how innovation is being increasingly used to ensure that the industry can come back stronger than ever post COVID-19. On behalf of all of us, I wish to extend a special note of gratitude to our speakers today for their valuable insights on the industry. In particular, our thanks go to Her Excellency Maryam bint Mohammed Al Muhairi, Minister of State for Food and Water Security for her important contribution to today's event. Now we return back to our businesses and we'll take away the knowledge that we shared here to look to build a better future for our sector. Yet as a final note, I wish to speak on the continued importance of industry collaboration during this time. The food and beverage sector, as we have seen throughout 2020, is not just about producing or selling of food stuff. It is an industry that quite literally places food on the table. Through our supply chains, families all around the world are fed. Through our decisions at forums, such as this one today, we help warrant the food security of not only the UAE, but also the entire region. As such, it is vital that as we emerge beyond this pandemic, we continue to ensure that our sector remains connected. We continue to collaborate with one another on leading projects. We continue to ensure the integration of technology at every level of our industry. The Seattle Middle East exhibition, due to take place in September 2021, will continue to provide an ideal forum for meaningful discussions on the future of the food and beverage sector. Our leading food, beverage and hospitality exhibition here in Abu Dhabi attracts major exhibitors from across the world to promote sector-wide innovation. We aim to continue to be the hub to foster your discussions on how your sector is emerging from the impact of the pandemic and which innovations this industry is implementing to bring, to bring new opportunities for all of us. At ADNIC, we look forward to being able to continue the conversation with you and your company at Seattle Middle East 2021. Stay safe and thank you. Our thanks to Mr. Dirar al Manasir for bringing our session to a close. We thank all of our speakers and panelists for their contributions and insightful session today. As we have heard, there are many reasons for all of us working in the food, beverage, and hospitality sectors to be optimistic about the future. We look forward to seeing each of you again at Seattle Middle East, which is due to be held in 7 to 9 September 2021. Until then, on behalf of Abu Dhabi National Exhibitions Company and Comexposium organizers of Seattle Middle East, thank you for attending today's session and we hope you enjoy the remainder of your day.